Hey everybody, it's Thursday, and you know what that means. I'm on Twitter answering your questions for you. And sorry if I sound really nasal. My nose is really stuffed up, and I can't decide if it's half allergies, which I don't have, I didn't think I had, or if I have a cold. So that's why my nose is a little red and sore from me, like, honk, blowing it all day long. Okay, and if I sneeze, I apologize. So, today I'm on Twitter. You, you have used the hashtag KDFAQ, and that's how I found your questions, and now I'm going to answer them. Oh, it's tickling me already. Fight the urge. Okay, I have five questions, and obviously I have my journal topic at the end, which is actually a really good one. I'm getting pretty clever. I'm pretty proud of myself. Okay, so without further ado, the first question is, my parents think an eating disorder is all about being thin. How can I help them to understand? There are a couple things. Um, like I've talked about in other videos, writing them a letter and giving it to them or picking a time to talk to them about it and I find it best to talk to parents in the more direct way like I talk about in my video about how to talk to my parents about my eating disorder self-harm talking to them and keeping things very simple like this is what it is this is why I think I do it and this is what I need from you and keeping it simple because parents often don't understand Sean keep it down he's making dinner Ugh. so um, I find keeping it really simple is the easiest way so they don't get confused and you can explain yourself clearly. Also, I have a video about it. Have them watch the video. If they can't watch like a, you know, 10 minutes of video, I think that that would probably be the best. And writing the letter to make sure that you're clear and you help explain. Um, I would have them, I, I don't know, look through a couple of my videos. There's quite a few that would work for it, um, but I think just talking to them about what purpose it serves and how you use it as a coping skill um, would really help them to understand, okay? Now number two, do you believe a person has to be in therapy for life? What if they want to be a therapist too? Um, no, we don't have to be in therapy for life. Um, I do believe that therapy should be part of your life always. In that, I mean, whether you're doing things for yourself, like you're journaling, you're getting outside into the outdoors with your girlfriends, you're spending time on yourself and doing self-care. To that end, yes, therapy should always be part of our life. So we should always be doing things to better ourselves and to learn from the things that we have, um, you know, things we've done and things that didn't work and did work, and we need to learn from that and grow. However, I do believe we should be in therapy for, you know, significant portions. I mean, for me, right now, I'm actually currently taking a break as of last week or the week before because things are okay right now. I don't really have anything. A lot of it I was building up to the wedding and how do I manage that stress with my life stress and my vlogging and all the stuff, right? But right now, I don't really need it. And I, if you and your therapist come to an agreement where, like, Jana, my therapist, is like, yeah, Katie, you know, just call me when you need another appointment. We won't schedule one right now. You're okay. So... Keep that in mind, and I would feel free to take breaks, but feel free to go back, and knowing when and when to go back and when you don't need to go back is all part of the process of therapy, and that's what I would definitely work on with your therapist, knowing those cues that tell us that we're kind of going off course, okay? Number three, can you overthink yourself into an eating disorder? Not really. You can take the eating disorder little seed that has been planted and you can water it so that it grows, but you can't plant that seed. You can make your eating disorder get worse quicker if you're thinking about it and acting on it and ruminating over the things more frequently, then that can definitely stir it up, but we can't just overthink ourselves into creating an eating disorder, okay? It's not, it's not like that. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden one day I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna start binge eating. I'm gonna have binge eating disorder. It's not like that. It's more of a coping skill, and it's something that we honestly usually don't realize we're doing at the very beginning. Okay? Ooh, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Fight it. Okay. Question number four. I act like whomever I am with. How do I stay myself or even find out who I am when I'm around other people? Um, this is a really good question, and I think a lot of us struggle with this. It also depends on our age. I find the teen years, like the early teens, like 13, 14, 15, are really, really hard for us. And some of us feel really good about ourselves. We know who we are. We feel really strong. And some of us aren't like that, and we're trying to find it. And at that time in your life, I honestly think it's okay to try on different groups of friends. I remember when I was that age, I had like my preppy friends, then like my sports team friends, and then I had like the stoner slash grungy group of people friends, and you slowly find out who you have the most in common with 
and you s start becoming the person that you are. It's not something that we can just all of a sudden, boom, I know who I am. So take your time with figuring it out and be open to making mistakes and realizing that I don't actually like playing soccer or I don't really like music that much or I actually really enjoy doing community service. So I want to join a group of people who do community. I mean, there are so many things that we can do that can help shape who we are. Be open to the process of it. And to that end, when it's hard to figure out who we are or stay who we are, I think taking the time and trying new things and taking time on your own to think about what you enjoy. I mean, I love to sing and I love being in choirs and I, but do I want to like be on American Idol or create, you know, be this big star? No, that's not really what I want to do. And that's a difference, right? And I've figured that out. So take time. Journal about the things you like to do, the things you've tried to do that you don't really like to do, and why. And that will still start to see that you already really know who you are. And once we accept that, we be more confident, we're stronger, and we're more assured in who we are. And that will allow you to keep being yourself when you're around other people. It's a process. It's going to take a time. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of, um, you know, mistakes and things that we're going to make in the, during that process. But oh, be open to it. We all go through it. It's okay. Um, and keep me posted. Okay. Question number five. Final question. I am the mom of a seven-year-old boy, and I worry about his eating habits. He hides his food, secretly eats, and will even binge on snack foods, eating entire cases of food at one time. I'm so scared that he will end up with an eating disorder. Do you have any suggestions of what I could be doing? There are a couple things. Um, he's only seven and he's a boy. So I know that it's more difficult to talk to a seven-year-old boy than it is a seven-year-old girl just because developmentally we're at different stages. Um, first thing we can do as a parent is we don't keep that binge food around the house. Now I know it sounds like, oh, we're controlling it and I, we need to deal with the underlying issue. And yes, we do. But... I wouldn't buy any of those things. Like if he's eating chips or uh, I think it was goldfish she was saying, don't buy them, don't keep them in the house. We'll keep fruits and veggies and healthy snacks available and cut up so he can eat them whenever he wants. Um, and I think talking to him a little bit about nutrition and how we know when we're hungry and when we're full and modeling that behavior. Because when they're that young, the most important thing, Sean is making a lot of noise. The most important thing is to model appropriate behavior. So I would even consider buying that in intuitive eating workbook that I talk about all the time and talking with him about hey I'm hungry I'm, I think I'm a four maybe a three how about you and have him rate himself and then when you're eating when you're about halfway done say hey honey how full do you think you are I think I'm about a seven I'm almost done how about you and checking in so he can test his hunger fullness and also giving him outlets for um, whatever it may be that he could potentially be coping by eating. So if that is um, maybe joining a sports team or an art group of sorts or even just getting outside with him and kicking a ball around or just walking, walking the dog, anything like that, giving him an outlet will definitely help with that as well. So I know that's a lot of different things you can try, but it's a process and it's wonderful that you're catching on to it so early um, because a lot of times children don't learn coping skills early on and that's what will turn into an eating disorder as well as the fact that he's turning to food and binging to comfort him, okay? Journal topic of the day. Now, I was reading about this on one of my favorite websites um, about things that we've learned in our life and how some lessons are really hard to learn and some are easy to learn and some really leave a mark on us. And some of the things that I've learned that I want to share with you and some that I got from the website that maybe will spark some ideas in you. Um, and here are some of those things. I've learned that you shouldn't compare yourself to the best others can do. So don't compare yourself to others because they're not you, right? I've learned um, that it's taking me a long time to become the person I want to be. Back to that question I'd answered, it can take us a while to figure that out. I've learned that we're responsible for what we do no matter how we feel. So even if we're angry and we lash out, I'm still responsible for that response and what I did during that time. Um, I've learned that you can get by on charm for about 15 minutes and after that you better know something, right? Pe you, people are going to ask questions and you need to be prepared. And that's kind of, you know, I've learned to be prepared. I've learned that you that either you control your attitude or it controls you. And that's something that I'm still learning. It's in progress, right? Because sometimes 
you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you're grouchy and you ruin your whole day. But I've learned that I can actually control it and I can put on music that makes me happy and I can call someone who puts my mind at ease and I can stop off and get that pumpkin spice latte that I've been wanting because it's amazing and I can turn my day around, right? So I want you to take some time and think of what things that you have learned in your life. What are things that you you know you've learned and what are some things that are in pro like you're in the progress or in the process of learning? Um, and, you know, was it hard to learn these lessons? Was it easy? Why? Why do you think it was harder? Um, take some time because I think oftentimes we don't take time aside in our regular day to think about the things that we've learned that day or that week or that year and to think about maybe what we're in the process of learning and taking the, I don't know, it's kind of like celebrating our successes, right? And noticing what it is and leave comments below on what you've learned so we can help share with each other. Okay. I will see you all tomorrow on Friday on Facebook Friday. So use the hashtag KDFAQ or at the beginning of your question to me in the first couple sentences, try to make your question as short and concise as possible. And I will get to those. Have a wonderful evening. I'll talk to y'all soon. Bye.